Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Philippines uh, Update. And joining us from Manila uh, via Skype is uh, Dante Klink Ong II, Editor-in-Chief of the Manila Times. The Manila Times is the oldest English language newspaper in the Philippines, having been founded in 1898. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Bill. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, this is a really a pretty big year for the Philippines, it seems to me. APEC is being held there. Um, I, as you were mentioning just before we went on the air, uh, November 18th and 19th, uh, when they have the economic leaders meeting, has been declared a holiday in the Philippines. Um, That's correct. What are your expectations out of APEC? Uh, to be honest, um, not much. Um, <laughs> there is an opportunity. There's an opportunity, I think, for uh, for the leaders to to meet, you know, particularly our, our president and, of course, the Chinese leader. And at any time, I think, that that happens, of course, there's an opportunity, I think, to find more uh, peaceful alternatives to disputed territories in the South, uh, South China Sea, or the West Philippine Sea, as we call it. You know what you say, you're not expecting very much. You know, a few years ago, I guess, who was it, 2011, we had APEC here in Hawaii, and everybody in Hawaii was really excited. Oh, APEC will bring this opportunity. It will bring this opportunity. It will position Hawaii here in the middle of the Pacific as an important hub in the international business world, and nothing happened. Well, you know, uh, maybe I will, uh, as a newspaper man, I'm a bit skeptical, but... Uh... <laughs> Um, you know, the, there, there is an that goes with the occupation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the Philippines will be in the limelight. You know, the the the, the attention of the world will be on the Philippines on on those days. And uh, as you said, you know, uh, in the Philippines, it's it's already been declared a national a national holiday just to, I suppose, to manage the the, the traffic and make the play the, the venues more secure and. Uh, but, you know, there, there is going to be a lot of attention on the Philippines, and that's, that's good. That is good. That is good. Now, it, it, you know, I might suffer from a, a little bit of that same occupational hazard that you do, you know, the pessimism of journalism. But the, the one good thing that came out of APEC in Hawaii was they did a lot of road repair work to impress world leaders before <laughs> the conference. So we... we well, actually... The Manila has been sprucing up for several months now ahead of the APEC. So I, I guess that's, you know, if you, if you come to Manila again, you'll probably notice many, uh, many of the improvements that, that have been going on for, for several months now. So not all is lost. But <laughs> <laughs> um. well, like I said, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of attention in the Philippines. There's an opportunity for the leaders of Asia Pacific to meet, and we're going to be at the center of it, and of course, Hopefully that we can take advantage of the opportunities uh, that will be present there. Good, good. Uh, well, I, I, I hope things work out well for the Philippines with APEC. Um, let's move on and talk about President Aquino. Uh, mm -hmm. He's coming somewhat close to the end of his term in office. Um, well, what do you think will be the final assessment of him? As you know, I, I know he's got a little ways to go yet, but at this point, what do you think will be the final assessment of President Aquino? Oh, sure. Uh, well, President Aquino has, um, until next year, the elections uh, in the Philippines is going to be in May. Mm -hmm. um, it just may be too early to, to have a final analysis of what the Aquino administration is going to be like. But we have to give, give it to him. He's remained very popular throughout his term, although his popularity ratings have dipped a little. I mean, it's still extremely high for a president, especially one who's approaching the, the final months of, of his term. Mm. Um, so um, there are a lot of question marks about what will happen just based on what happened with the previous transitions in, in, in the Philippines. So there's still a few things that are not clear, but um, uh, the facts are that he's very popular and uh, he um, uh, hope and that there will be an election. That's, that's the, those are two good things. Do you, do you see anybody that's likely to succeed him at this point, or is it too early? Well, you know, there are at least three people um, running for president next year. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the administration has, uh, Secretary Mauro has as its chosen candidate for the presidential elections. The vice president is also running. 
mm -hmm. along with one of the, one of the popular senators, uh, Grace Poe. Mm -hmm. So uh, there may be one other candidate, but um, there will be at least three for mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. So things are beginning to take shape. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Philippines uh, is really obsessed with elections. Uh, uh, politics here is a national pastime. So the, uh, the, the official deadline to file the candidacy is next month. Oh, so we'll know, by, we'll know by the middle of next month how many candidates we'll have for, for next year's elections. But the campaigning has been going on for years now. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, when, when President Aquino was first elected to office, a lot of commentary, <clears throat> I think, in various publications here and there, said that for him to be really successful, he had to be a traitor to his class. Has he been? Um, to be honest, I don't see it. Um, although uh, his benchmark is different. What he's been saying is that uh, he's going to champion the fight against corruption. That has been his mantra throughout mm -hmm. uh, his term as president. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the results of that is not going to be clear for a few more years, which is why I said earlier that it may be too early. It may be too early. It may be too early to uh, determine the success of his presidency. But um, uh, I think that th that is going to be the, the, the measurement by which they will see if he was successful as president or not. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Well, I, you know, it, it seems to me, as, as I understand things in the Philippines, um, land reform is always sort of an issue that's important, kind of ongoing. And um, it was said that, um, for, as I understand it, um, mm -hmm. for him to carry out his ideas about land reform, that he would probably have to give up some of the acreage in his own hacienda. Did, right. did that ever happen? Well, you know, to put it in perspective, land reform has been going on since the 1960s. Okay. And, um, one of the contentious issues between this administration and the past administration was a ruling by the Supreme Court that basically forces forces uh, his family to to sell their their land holdings to the tenant farmers. Um, now that that um, deal has not been fully consummated yet because there has been problems with the valuation of, of the property and of course the actual actual parceling out of of the of the titles and rights or whatever form it will be that will be given to the farmers. So um, it, President Aquino did not start it. He seemed to be a, a reluctant participant to it. Uh, uh, if reports are to believe, you know. But uh, in public, he has been supportive of, of course, reforms that will improve poverty poverty in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what would he likely do after he leaves office? Would he, would he seek to be reelected to the Philippine Senate? Would he just be a retired senior statesman? What, what, what's he likely to do? It's, it's not clear yet, Bill. Um, as I said, you know, next month is the deadline for filing of candidacy for national offices. And one of the intriguing things developing is that uh, the presidential choice for the next candidate is having trouble finding a vice presidential candidate. And so for a while, there were some people from the Liberal Party, the party of the president, floating the idea of maybe the president can be the running mate. As a uh, vice president. As a vice president, but that did not, I don't think that will pan out. I mean, they were, I think some people were just trying to float the idea. Of course, the former president um, uh, ran in Congress, in the House of Representatives. So she is a congresswoman. Uh, it's it's not quite clear yet, but I'm sure it will be in the next few weeks. Mm. Mm. Wow. It's it's very interesting. Well, um, let's talk about the the growth of the Philippine economy. The last few years, the the Republic of Philippine economy seems to have been doing very very well. What, what what's that attributed to? Do you see that continuing? Um, there's a there's a big momentum for for the for economic growth in the Philippines, and you know the I think the government would like to take credit for it, but in all honesty, I think we have to give our overseas workers their due. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the remittances to the Philippines is equivalent to about 10% of the GDP. Wow. Uh, there's also a growing, um, a growing uh, business outsourcing industry in the Philippines. And uh, reports have it that their contribution to the economy is to equal or maybe surpass the contributions of the OFW. So those two major, major uh, contributions are, are uh, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, factor fueling our growth. And then, of course, you have the political capital of President Aquino. He is uh, well received around the world. Uh, uh, people still think fondly of his mother when she was president. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, in combination of the good image of the Philippines, uh, puts us in, in a sweet spot. Um, so it's, uh, it's encouraged foreign investment, in other words? Well, yes. I mean, of course, the, the image is, is helpful in attracting uh, foreign investments. But having said that, there are still changes that need to happen. I think to make the Philippines more competitive relative to the other investment destinations in, in Asia. For example? Well, uh, energy costs, for example, is very high. Uh, mm -hmm. Although the government has been saying that uh, uh, that has been factored in, factored in by investors, but our energy cost is probably second only to Japan. Wow. Um, the taxes, wow. the tax issues are, are another matter. You know. Uh, you see that Singapore, Thailand, and other Malaysia and other countries making it attractive for foreign investors to invest in their countries. Um, the Philippines has been lagging behind in that regard. You know, one thing that strikes me um, is I, I hear so many people say that the beaches in the Philippines are beautiful, they're wonderful, but to the best of my knowledge, the Philippine government doesn't really promote tourism. Well, the, you know, I, I have a, a lot of beef with the government, Bill. But you know, I, <laughs> you, have to, you have to give work. You have to give credit where credit is due. The government okay. has been actually trying to trying to promote um, in the, uh, tourism arrivals in the Philippines, and they're actually very close to their target of increasing tourist arrivals to six million a year, uh, which is pales in comparison to Thailand, which has 20 million. Uh, I, I think uh, even Malaysia is close to 20 million uh, tourist arrivals a year, so we're a long way off. Um, but I think where the, this government is a bit lacking is in the tourism infrastructure. Um, the airport in Manila has been voted as one of the worst in the world. Um, mm. We need to have, I think, more airports rather than, you know, in addition to the ones we have in Manila. Uh, the roads going to the tourist destinations have to be, have to be improved. And of course, the hotel development uh, still have to, have to follow as well. Mm. That's very interesting. You know, I, um, the, the last time I was in the, the Philippines, a few years ago when we met for dinner, uh, you invited us out to dinner. I, I, I was kind of shocked that there was no airport in Baguio, which is a, seems to me to be a, a very nice hillside resort, uh, pretty cool yes. in the, when it gets really hot in the Philippines. And, and the bus ride there from Manila is pretty, but it's a bit torturous at the same time. Um, I, I saw, I, when you say, you know, the Philippines really needs to beef up its infrastructure for tourism, and you mentioned airports, I, I that, that example comes clearly yeah, to well, mind. Baguio, in fairness, has a municipal airport. Uh, it's not an international airport. It's, uh, it's, it's plagued by weather problems, so you know, there, when there's a little fog, you know, it, it makes it a bit treacherous to, to fly there. So mm. people opt to take a land route, and as you experience, you know, it's not the most comfortable, but... Uh, <laughs> There have been some developments since uh, you came. Uh, a new highway has, has, has been worked on. It doesn't reach all the way to Baguio, but it brings you a bit closer. I'm talking about the Tardak Pangasinan uh, Expressway, or what they call a T-plex, but it only goes so far. But there are plans um, in the works to extend it all the way uh, to the north, so make it easier for people like you visiting the northern province. It's easier. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's great. Um, well, you, you mentioned you had a few beefs with the Philippine government. Um, wh what are they? What's your number one beef? 
Well, um, the, the, the promise has been really to, um, to battle corruption. And, and um, I, th I think uh, we, we have to wait whether or not the government has, has been successful in that regard. And I have my doubts. And um, my, my main beef really is that, you know, he had, President Aquino had so much popularity and he still enjoys quite a bit, uh, quite a high popularity rating. And I just wish he would channel, channel that, that political capital into some constructive. You know, mm -hmm. what, what, what he has been accused of really is, is uh, vindictiveness, political vindictiveness instead mm -hmm. of... Uh, being a, being a leader who looks forward, he's constantly been looking uh, at the at the past administration and saying, you know, what uh, outlining the things that have been done wrong, you know. Uh, but the criticism is that he's been in office for more than five years now. He's on his last year. You know, maybe it's time that he uh, look beyond uh, he look beyond uh, the past and look start looking at the future. Mm. We're going to take a break here. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dante Klinkong II, Editor-in-Chief of the Manila Times, joining us from Manila via Skype. And we'll be right back. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim. You've been here today, you've seen this, you heard what she said, what do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Philippines Update, and joining me from Manila uh, via Skype is Dante Klingkong II, Editor-in-Chief of the Manila Times, the oldest English language newspaper in the Philippines, having been founded in 1898. Well, before the break, oh, by the way, I'd like to encourage our audience to tweet in your questions. Our guest is uh, happy to answer them. Uh, before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, President Aquino. I, I noticed had a couple more things I was curious about. Uh, what's his relationship with the church? Well, it's been um, a challenging <laughs> relationship, I would say. Uh, you know, the, the president came out strong against uh, the reproductive health bill, uh, which the church is very much against. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and it, I, I would say it hasn't warmed up since. And that was at the beginning of his, of his term. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I, I have to say, um, from my perspective, sitting here in Hawaii, I sort of admire politicians that are willing to take on big institutions like that. Uh, if, if they think that there is a, a positive gain to be made. And as I understood it, he, he sincerely felt that there was a positive gain to be made. 
Um, the Bangsa Mora. Uh, by the way, at this point, um, Zuri, can we put that map of the Philippines up on the screen? This might help our viewers. Okay. Um, we, get, uh, we had a pretty colorful map of the Philippines there. And the Bang Samora essentially is very much focused on very southern Philippines, um, correct? Well, yeah, the, the, the bill uh, that goes by that name refers to the Muslim areas in, in Mindanao. Okay. In the south, yes. Okay. And the Bang Samora essentially is to create some sort of, um, how should I say, um, peace, um, improved relationship between Mindanao and the Muslims in that area and the central government in Manila? Well, what's, what's been happening for the past, past several years is that one group, which is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or the MILF, has been conducting peace, peace talks with the government. Um, you have to understand, and I think not many people do, that there are actually several groups in Mindanao, but it is the MILF who presented themselves as the representatives of what they call as the Bang Samoro, um, representing, maybe, I think, about a dozen or 13 different uh, groups of, of Muslims, and they are the ones actually now trying to um, uh, work on um, uh, a, a law that was the product of peace talks between the government and the rebel group. So it is, um, do you see much positive action on the, on the Bang Samora agreement? Is it, is it moving along or is it... Is well, it right now it's, it's, stalled in, it's stalled in Congress. But let me maybe put things in perspective. Sure. I think if you, if you ask Filipinos whether or not they are for peace, I think everyone here is for peace. The question, I think, and this is what's plaguing the bill that is now um, forcing its way through Congress, is whether or not the, pres the present draft of the bill will actually resolve the problems in Mindanao. That's, mm. that's the issue. I see. The uh, MILF says that this is what is needed to bring peace and prosperity in Mindanao. Of course, there are skeptics who say that this bill will be a stepping stone for for some Muslims in Mindanao to secede from the Philippines. Mm. So that's that's a, that's a major that's a major concern that needs to be addressed. And mm. so, um, in the deliberations in Congress, there were some questions whether or not parts of the bill or the entire bill itself was actually constitutional. Mm. And so, what's happening now is that the lawmakers who were charged to review that have made a new draft and a new draft is now being discussed in Congress. Mm. Mm. And the new draft is supposed to address the obvious constitutional infirmities of the original draft. Mm. So there's still a ways to go. I think there is a ways to go, but you know, I think this government is, is bent on, on pushing it. But I, I think those who who uh, say are on the other side say that you know you should not put a deadline on peace. It's not a matter of getting it done quickly. It's a matter of getting it done correctly. Mm -hmm. mm, that's a good point. Let's move on to uh, U.S. Republic of Philippines relations. Um, they seem to be doing very well right now. Extremely well, and uh, we're you know by accident of geography in the center of America's concern, you know. Uh, you have the, the U.S. foreign policy pivot to Asia, and we're right in the middle of Asia, mm -hmm. so right in the shadow of China. So. Well, well, what's the typical um, Filipino feeling about the U.S. rebalance to Asia? Well, you know, historically, there has been uh, um, uh, friendly, warm relations between Filipinos and Americans. And, you know, uh, I, I think many Filipinos aspire to, to be the little brother of the United States, you know. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think relations have been always been friendly. We have a lot of family in the United States. Uh, especially here in Hawaii. Especially there in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, yeah, Americans to us are, you know, sort of like family. 
Mm-hmm. And with the growing importance of Asia, uh, I, I think uh, we sense that there's a renewed appreciation of of the relationship with the Philippines on the part of the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, China's bullying um, has probably helped that relationship become even closer. W- would that be fair to say? I, I would think so, but you know, again, that's another issue that I, I have with the, this government. You know, um, uh, whether you know the, the government has been very antagonistic about uh, the, the the Chinese and their movements in the West Philippine Sea. Um, but um, our paper's position has been, you know, why antagonize China? I mean, uh, there, there's got to be some diplomatic, uh, better, better ways to, to deal with the problem. They're not easy problems to, to, to deal with, mind you, mm. but there, there, there's got to be some other ways to approach the issue. Because whether we like it or not, we have to live with China because they're, we're such close neighbors. That's sort of the situation every country in Asia is confronted with, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, given China's central position in Asia, I mean, so many Asian countries border China. It's never very far away from anybody. Um, well, uh, okay, now, uh, I've read in rec- very recently that um, the Philippines is reopening or expanding um, Subic Bay Naval Base. And um, of course, I know that you know that was a former US naval base that closed in the 1990s. Uh, US ships were allowed to pull in there for repairs. But in the future, are we going to see more US ships in Subic? Are, are there, is there going to be some US ships permanently docked there, uh, or at least be there longer than has been the case since 1990? What's your take? Well, you know, of course, I'm not in government, but what, what we see is that there is an already an increasing pres- U.S. naval presence in the Philippines, and this is not surprising given uh, the, the tensions in the West Philippine Sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if um, there will be permanent ships docked in, in, the, in those former bases. Um, uh, it's, really, it's really hard to say. It all depends on how, um, how the situation in the West Philippine Sea uh, develops. If it gets worse, uh, I'm sure all sorts of options will be studied by our government and the U.S. government. Mm. It, it seems that um, there's more military cooperation between the Philippines and the U.S. these days, and more joint training operations. Um, it, it also seems like, um, I don't know, the reporting in the press here is not quite as, as substantive as one might like, but it seems like the U.S. has essentially built a base uh, in the very southern Philippines which it rotates troops through on a periodic basis and has created some sort of a visiting status of forces agreement um, and tries to keep everything below the radar screen. But once in a while, something happens that, you know, pushes the issue up onto the radar screen. Uh, what's, your, what's your take? What's your, what's your perspective? Well, you know, military cooperation between the Philippines and the U.S. And- it's not new. We've been having joint military exercises for for many years, even before even before this issue present even before the present issues cropped up. Um, but there is a growing um, need, I think, for 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 increased military presence on the part of the U.S. Um, that seems to be my sense, right? But um, as you said, everything is kept under the radar. Um, it's not, um, I don't think there are bases in the conventional sense in Mindanao, mm-hmm. but there are certainly increased, increased uh, rotation or whatever you call it of, of personnel. And uh, um, it's not entirely clear to us um, what the extent of that is, so we're not privy to, we're not privy to that information. Mm. 
We'll take another break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between Jan Japan and the Republic of the Philippines. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Klink Ong II, the editor-in-chief of the Manila Times. And we'll be right back. Hi, Jay. Hi, Keith. Is, <laughs> my name's Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that, too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Uh, You've got a great show going, thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah, so what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from, from academia, uh, from uh, pr practitioners of international affairs. Sometimes we have uh, military officials. Sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream That's media. the difference, isn't it? Exactly. That you're, you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do. Right. We're trying that's to, why we like you so much. We're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective, an intelligent perspective on what's going on and where both sides of the story, or even when there's more than two sides, we try to cover every angle. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech, is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. I watch it every week. Thanks very much. Why don't you guys watch it every week, too, OK? 4.45 to uh, 4 to 4.45 every Tuesday. <laughs> Welcome back to Haitian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. We're having a really interesting discussion here today uh, with Dante Klink on the second. Uh, he is executive editor, president and CEO of the Manila Times, the oldest newspaper in the Philippines, the oldest English language newspaper, founded in 1898. Just before the break, we have been talking about um, the Republic of Philippines uh, relationship with the United States. We want to move on to another important relationship and talk about that for a bit. And that's the burgeoning relationship between the Philippines and Japan. Um, you know, it, it's really kind of um, amazing to me that um, the Philippines essentially forgave Japan for its aggression in the islands during World War II. And since that point, the relationship has really gone forward. <laughs> I suppose that's the best way to put it. Um, but what's the popular view of that? Did that, did that um, forgiveness extended to Japan for its aggression in World War II, did that set well with the, the, the man on the street? Did they, did they buy into that? I, I mean, well, what's the popular feeling in the Philippines about that? Clearly, it was an idea that the government embraced. They put it forward. But what was the popular view? I think first, uh, people have to realize that the Philippine population is very young. I mean, more than 50% of our population is probably 23 years old and younger. Wow. So, I didn't so, realize uh, that. Right. So uh, I think um, many of the Filipinos today don't even remember 1986. <laughs> they weren't even born in 1986, <laughs> which is our people power revolution. So you, you, would, you would be challenged to find a majority of people remembering 1945, you know, uh, World, <laughs> World War II. Um, but, you know, since the war, um, Japan has become a, a very good friend of the Philippines. They're, they're a major source of, of development aid. Uh, they're a major source of foreign investments in the mm -hmm. Philippines. And over the decades now, Japan has, has become a, a strong um, friend and ally uh, of the Philippines. But there are still some sectors, mind you, small sectors, that, that have not yet forgotten. And, um, annually, there, there are people who make calls to, to Japan to formally apologize for the atrocities committed during World War II. Um, most people have forgotten World War II, but there are still a, a small group that still remembers. Mm. So, um, just last week, the Japanese Diet, uh, both houses of the Japanese Diet, passed the, um, the new defense guidelines, which enabled Japan to send its forces beyond Japanese shores and to act in other um, defense situations. 
Uh, of course, some people say, well, this is a return to Japanese imperialism. This is a return to Japanese militarism. Um, what was the reaction to that in the Philippines? Well, uh, for our paper, it was top news. Uh, top news, right. It's a, it's a, it's a, bit, it's a you know, major, major development. Mm -hmm. um, of course, people today probably view that in the context of China, uh, but you know, um, I think I would be speaking in the minority here. And I, I, I personally am concerned you know, that 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 we see uh, a, a return to the old way, all the Japanese policies, and I, I think this is something that we have to watch with with concern. Mm. Mm. So you know, mind you, though, the Philippines and Japan today are very good friends. Right. You know, but they say in diplomacy there are no permanent friendships. You know, um, today we may be friends, but you know, with uh, the militarization of Japan, this has uh, got to be something that we should look at very carefully. Mm. Mm. That's an interesting perspective. Um, of course, it, it seems to me, on the other hand, the. the as you mentioned, there's significant Japanese investments in, 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 the, um, in the Philippines. And also, as of late, the, Japan's extended a reasonable amount of military aid to uh, the Philippines as well, patrol boats and uh, that kind of thing. And I believe there's been some military security advice. That's also today, there. and actually they've been very, uh, they played a major role in the peace talks with the MILF. In fact, they've been the ones uh, pushing, pushing for the talks as well. So, mm. They're very much involved in, in domestic issues. Mm. Domestic issues. That's sometimes very tricky when another country gets involved in domestic issues. Um, is that, could that possibly boomerang on Japan? Well, um, I, don't see it, I don't see that happening right now because uh, the, the perception, the public perception is that they're concerned about peace in Mindanao and they have been trying to do what they can to usher, usher that process along. So uh, it's a positive participation so far, I think. Well, the other relationship um, that we really need to talk to, uh, talk about, is the relationship between the Philippines and the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Um, is it fair to say the relationship is? Um, Challenging. <laughs> it's, uh, that, that's probably a weak word. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely there are there are problems between the, the Philippines and China, but I think um, in, the Chinese would probably agree also that the relationship between the Philippines and China should not be defined by the disputed territories. Mm. Uh, people to people relations with China have, have extended all the way back before the, the Spaniards landed in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. There's been a long history of Philippine-Chinese relations and, you know, many Filipinos today have some Chinese blood. Even our national hero, Jose Rizal, sure. was one, one for Chinese. So there's a lot of history there. And, um, and of course, there's a lot of trade and investment between the Philippines and China. And there are many common interests. And so, uh, really, it, it's really, uh, I think, uh, regrettable that the relationship between the Philippines and China would be limited to the disputed territories issue. There's really, it's a really much more complicated, deeper relationship than that. Well, that, 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 that's a very interesting perspective because that's not one we usually read about. We usually read about, you know, sort of tensions um, between the Philippines and China, purely, as you suggested, over the South China Sea. Yes. Um, the Philippines has um, submitted its um, case to the uh, arbitral, uh, arbitral tribunal in the Hague. China refused to participate in that process, um, preferring to negotiate the situation with the Philippines on a one-on-one -on -one bilateral basis. Um, it suggests to me that the Chinese knew that they were going to lose in the in the in the tribunal. Um, but what's your take? Well, you know, uh, the tribunal option 
of course, was an option open to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Now, what China has been saying is that it's also the right in the same rules that not to participate. So uh, what you have there really is a, is, a, is a stalemate. But, you know, as you said, China has been pushing instead for a bilateral talk between the Philippines and China all over this issue. And the Philippines has um, not felt comfortable about talking directly with China. Uh, our paper's position has been the Philippines should talk. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we may not get to, you know, we may not reach an agreement, but, you know, I think the important thing is to keep uh, dialogue continuing. Uh, the, the communication lines open. I mean, that's 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 the important thing. So um, there's no, I, I we see no harm in talking, but uh, it's not the it's not the position of this government. Well, what's your personal feeling about the China's historic claim to the South China Sea, which they base on their nine dash line? Do you think that's valid, or do you think that that's invalid, or partially valid, partially invalid? Which what's, what's your take? Well, uh, you know, I think the only thing that's clear is that the issues are complicated. Um, oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, we uh, we may the Filipinos Filipinos will say that you know we have historic claims, and Chinese will say they have historic claims. Um, really, the only way to to resolve this is to to talk about it peacefully, and uh, I think it's in no one's interest, neither China's or the Philippines or the rest of the world's. Uh, to have tensions rise over over these issues. Mm. Um, hence, uh, our suggestion uh, over many editorials that you know, the Philippines should pursue uh, bilateral talks if bilateral talks is what's acceptable to the other, other party. You know, obviously, um, multilateral talks uh, in the tribunal are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where, where, where do you go from there? I mean, if, uh, if the other party does not participate. We're coming down to our last two minutes here, so I've got, I've got to pump in a couple other last minute sure. quick questions. Um, to what degree is the Philippines supported by ASEAN in its um, quest, its case before the tribunal? Well, you know, ASEAN has always moved with uh, consensus. And um, as we have been experiencing in the past several years with our government pushing for a united ASEAN stand, and uh, I don't think ASEAN will, will, will be united on the China issue, mm -hmm. only because each member state has its own national interest to look after. And uh, I think the Philippines has to, has to recognize that brutal reality that each one of us has a different take on, on China. Mm. Interesting point. Well, we're coming down to our last 30 seconds here. Uh, real, real quick question here. We both met in Taiwan on a trip for journalists. Um, how would you say the, the ROP's relationship is with Taiwan? There have been a lot of dispute over fishing rights and that sort of thing. Has everything calmed down? Sorry, I'm cutting you off with 50 sure, seconds it's, it's, here. Uh, uh, things are calm, but I think Taiwan is waiting for us to ratify a fisheries uh, agreement. Uh, I think it's something that is good for the Philippines to settle have a peaceful mechanism to settle you know encroachment to the territories i just hope that the philippine government would move more quickly great well uh, we're out of time that was a really great discussion uh thank you very much for joining us from manila today uh, i'm sure our viewers uh, uh will benefit from your perspective and i'd like to thank everybody out there in our tv audience for joining us and we'll see you the next time